Okay, good afternoon. My name is Chris Elam with GA Larson. Uh, this is part two of the Ream Inverter Product uh, webinars. Uh, yesterday we covered uh, the Ream Air Handlers, uh, the Ream Coils, uh, Heat Packs, and various components uh, regarding those uh, products. So today we're going to uh, kind of do an overview, uh, go over some of the outdoor unit components, uh, as well as troubleshooting, uh, charging, and diagnostics. So we'll get started here. Okay, uh, the basic operation overview, um, this is the RP20. Uh, this kind of goes for the RP20, RP17, as well as the RA20. Uh, obviously, the air conditioner does not have a uh, reversing valve, but uh, the operation and the bulk codes are the same. Uh, the RP series uh, Eco is EcoNet enabled. Uh, they all have inverter driven variable speed compressors. Uh, that are, when are connected to an Econet smart thermostat, uh, the system will operate at optimum capacity needed to maintain the desired set point temperature of the combined space. Uh, the 20, the 20, uh, RA20, RP20 uh, is up to 20 SEER, and in most cases it will operate at 20 SEER. Uh, 17 SEER is 17 SEER, uh, sometimes a, a little bit over, a little bit under on some applications. Uh, they do have to be matched systems. So if you're going to do a uh, R series, RP series, or RA series, it uh, has to match up with a specific coil as well as a specific furnace. Uh, all these uh, systems are available in 24,000, 36, 48, and 60,000 capacities. Uh, the EcoNet uh, smart thermostat allows homeowners to manage uh, high efficiency EcoNet enabled air conditioners heat pumps, gas furnaces. Uh, also, you can control your water heaters uh, if they're prestige EcoNet enabled uh, models, uh, as well as your pool heaters, uh, green pool heaters that are specifically EcoNet enabled. Uh, EcoNet enabled products in a home are connected through standard uh, HVAC wiring. Uh, homeowners can access the system remotely through a free app. Uh, EcoNet acts as both thermostat for heating and cooling and remote control for both water heaters uh, and pool heaters if you have one. Uh, the result of this is advanced technology uh, is improved energy efficiency and comfort. Uh, energy efficiency is improved uh, by precise load matching, uh, less cycling on and off, and low amp gradual compressor. Uh, Comfort is improved by precise temperature control, uh, precise humidity control, and extra capacity during extreme summer and weather cold conditions. Uh, they do have what they call the 17s and both 20s have what they call an overdrive feature. Uh, the overdrive feature uh, is available uh, in, in summertime if it's over 100 degrees, uh, or if it's in the wintertime if it's below 30 degrees. Uh, just because it's below the temperature or above the temperature doesn't mean you're going to go into overdrive, but that capacity is there. So what that uh, overdrive feature is, it allows the compressor to ramp up past uh, what its normal acceptable limits are, uh, the RPMs. So in some cases, you can ramp up to 6,500 all the way up to 7,000 RPMs to achieve uh, more cooling or more heat than what is expected. Uh, the EcoNet wire connections, when an EcoNet smart thermostat is used, you're only using four wires to connect to the control, the indoor and outdoor units. Uh, two of the wires, uh, that's the R and the C, uh, power the controls, uh, and the other two wires, E1, E2, are communication wires. Uh, part of the EcoNet control, when this system is connected to an EcoNet smart thermostat, uh, all speeds, protection routines, airflow setup, system startup adjustments are done at the thermostat. Uh, generally, your uh, dip switches will be completely overridden, uh, so they don't matter. Uh, in fact, if the dip switches are set from factory, 
the factory positions and an EcoNet smart thermostat is being used, they are ignored. Uh, the setup parameters are contained on memory cards, uh, both the indoor and the outdoor units. Uh, so upon power up, uh, the EcoNet will gather that information from the memory cards and configure the system without any input from the installing technician. It will only let it operate within certain parameters. Uh, the EcoNet thermostat also has options for manual adjustments of some parameters, uh, including minor airflow and superheat adjustment. Part of the EcoNet temperature control, uh, the EcoNet variable speed outdoor unit continuously monitors temperature, humidity, suction pressure, suction temperature, outdoor coil temperature, outdoor ambient temperature, and feeds this information to the Copeland inverter control motor drive. Uh, if there is a need to condition the air, the system will start. Uh, the Copeland inverter control motor in the outdoor unit, uh, it converts AC to a DC signal and then sends that to the Copeland control compressor. Simultaneously, the control board in the outdoor unit provides inputs to the ECM fan motor, which is equipped with the latest swept wing technology, uh, the bat wing type fan, uh, and the EXV, the control board syncs up the compressor speed to deliver the exact capacity that the home needs to meet the comfort requirements. Uh, the indoor fan motor speed will vary as well to match the outdoor speed. So if you're in a very, very low RPM, uh, your compressor, uh, so say if you're around 2300 RPMs, uh, your, fan, your outdoor fan motor will also slow down. And then as a byproduct, your indoor fan motor will also slow down. So you're looking to match uh, compressor speeds, um, fan speeds, deliver exactly the amount of heat or cool that you need. Sensor responses. Uh, the system has pressure sensors, temperature sensors that provide information uh, to the indoor and outdoor control boards. Should any of these sensors indicate a potential problem, uh, built-in override corrective responses will take place, uh, including speed changes with the compressor uh, or system lockout. If the system detects a lockout, the information will be displayed on the EcoNet smart thermostat and also on the indoor or outdoor control boards. Uh, if you do have to, if your EcoNet goes down in a pinch and you need some emergency heating or cooling, or in some cases people choose to use other thermostats other than EcoNet, uh, you can actually operate them under standard 24 volt control. Now, when you're using these as a 24 volt control system, uh, they basically turn into, instead of being a uh, variable capacity compressor, um, as in the RA20 and the RP20, um, they'll basically turn into a three stage operation. So all three units will basically be three stage as opposed, as opposed to variable capacity. Um, efficiency wise, it's still the same, but you will lose uh, the full control. Uh, it is important that the line voltage uh, they're available in 208, 230, single phase configuration. Uh, operation voltages at maximum load conditions must be between 197 and 253 volts AC. Uh, the supply voltage wiring to these units must be copper wiring only. It is imperative uh, with these systems if you have voltage spikes or you're running extremely high, uh, approaching that 250 mark, 251, 252, um, eventually you'll probably end up uh, having inverter drive troubles and or eventual compressor issues. Um, ideally, you want to be down in the 240s, 245s. At that, at that, you're safe. So if you, if you go too low, you'll have problems. If you go towards the high side, you'll actually cause board and compressor failures. Now, some neat features about this uh, has built in basically low ambient uh, cooling mode operation range. Uh, these systems may be operated in cooling mode at outdoor ambient temperatures between, between zero and 125 degrees. 
Uh, low ambient cooling accessories are not available on this. Uh, they will provide low ambient cooling down to zero degrees out to outdoor. Uh, heat mode operation. These systems may be operating in a heating mode, out, outdoor, amb outdoor ambient temperatures up to 77 degrees. Operating capacity ranges and heat mode operation, the main plate capacity can be delivered at temperatures as low as 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, if the indoor air temperature and the demand for cooling is very high and the outdoor temperatures go in the outdoor units, uh, they will eventually go into overspeed mode, providing they meet the uh, temperature set points. Above 100 in summertime, below 30 in the wintertime. Now we'll go over some of the components here. If you have never seen one of these units before or worked on or serviced them, uh, when you take off the electric, electrical panel, this is what you'll see. You'll see three distinct boards in here. Uh, it's kind of a simple way to, to simplify it. Uh, the bottom board is your brains. It's called your variable speed control board. Uh, you have the middle board. That's going to be your cleaning feature. That's going to be your filter board. So it's trying to filter out any kind of uh, dirty power that may affect the drive and the compressor. And then at the top, you have the drive board. That's what actually powers your compressor. Now, good look, good close up look at the drive board here. There's two basic boards that you'll see. Um, you'll see this one here, which kind of goes for the two ton and three ton models. Uh, the four and five ton models, they actually look like they have a, it almost looks like it's two boards, but it's like a board stacked upon a board. It's very distinct. Um, but component wise, uh, connection wise, they're the same. So up here on top, you'll see you have a DC minus and a DC plus. Uh, if the unit's charged up and storing power, uh, you'll still have a voltage, a DC voltage there. So once you pull your disconnect, uh, don't start reaching in, grabbing things because you will get hurt. Uh, these will store electricity for up to up to five minutes. Uh, so uh, at least wait three to five minutes. At that point, you can check your DC plus and minus to see if you're holding any kind of DC voltage there. Once that's dissipated, feel free to uh, work on it and make anything you need to do. Down towards the left, middle there, you have the choke connections. Uh, there's a choke that's installed on these. Uh, the choke is specifically designed to absorb any kind of spikes that may occur in the system. Uh, it tries to absorb those before it gets into the drive board and causes damage to the drive board or compressor. Now, right here is your line voltage into this board. Uh, this is where your filter board, L1 and L2, come in. Come in. So this is your L1, L2 from your filter board. Up here, you see this nine-pin connector. There's a, a gray wire that actually feeds from here all the way down to the bottom board, your variable speed board. Uh, that's your Modbus connection uh, to the variable speed control board. So that's where it receives its input and how to operate. Uh, you also have some indicator LEDs here. Uh, down here, you'll see a compressor discharge line temperature sensor connection. Uh, that's basically uh, sensing the discharge temperature. Uh, it's making sure it's not going too high. Uh, if it does, it'll actually start slowing down. It tries to protect the compressor as much as possible. Uh, here you have your high pressure high pressure switch connection. Uh, right here you have your compressor output. You have your U, V, and W. Uh, that's feeding the compressor itself. Uh, another note here on these, um, if you have power to these boards, um, they can be very dangerous as long as you use your head. And don't touch anything, use your meter leads. Um, you can test any points on here you need to test. Uh, 
do not pull these out when the bower's live. Because you can end up short, short enough, shorten the board right there if you do that. Uh, the inverter board is designed by Copeland for use specifically with three variable speed compressors. Uh, the drive will power the compressor, control the compressor running speed, provide compressor and drive position protection, uh, and communicate with the variable speed outdoor control board with the DSODC board. Uh, the drive requires cooling. Uh, this, this is provided by an aluminum heat sink attached to the back of the inverter board. So if you kind of look inside uh, where the fan is and you look down there, you'll see uh, very large uh, like aluminum fans there. Uh, where's the actual heat dissipating? Uh, if those get clogged up with dirt and debris or what have you, um, your drive will overheat and you'll fault out. Uh, now the back side of that drive where those aluminum fans are, um, it's not connected to the drive itself. It's providing uh, cooling for the drive. So if you get it wet or what have you, it's not going to it's not going to do anything to you. The primary frequent primary purpose of the drive is to convert a 60 hertz AC voltage into a variable frequency, a variable voltage output to power the variable speed control compressor. The drive conditions the AC input volt, voltage through a series of processes to arrive at the desired output. Uh, the drive first converts the AC into, uh, converts the AC input voltage to a DC voltage. Uh, the DC voltage is then pulse width modulated to rep represent or replicate a uh, sinusoidal uh, current at a desired frequency and range. Uh, output voltage to the compressor is located at the circuit board at U, V, and W. Uh, these connections are phase sensitive and should always be connected per the color order on the schematic. Uh, if you mix those up, uh, you can't have it run backwards. So I've had a couple of them that were stuck or we thought were shorted. Um, they wouldn't start, so you can switch those around and try to bump it. Um, but if you cross those up, it will run backwards more than likely. Um, and the output voltage to these terminals, the UV and W, or UV and uh, W there, uh, it's not going to be a specific voltage. Uh, it could be 80 volts, it could be 110, 180, you know, whatever the voltage is. But what you're looking for uh, to verify that your drive is putting out the correct voltage, uh, you're looking for equal voltage between the UV and W. So you have 80 on U, 80 on V, 80 on W, your drive is at least putting out the proper voltage. So at that point, uh, up to that point, everything is fine back. You, you verify that your drive is doing what it's supposed to do. Here's your variable speed control board. It's the bottom board, which I call the brains. Uh, you've got two sections of low voltage terminals here. Uh, you've got your RT, which is not used. You've got your E1, E2, and then you have your standard uh, 24 volt connections. So if you're doing a fully communicating system, you're using R, C, E1, E2. Now it is important to understand that your E1, E2, whatever colors you use for E1 or E2, they have to be the same all the way through. There has to at least be the same line. Because uh, if you cross those, if you have a, a black on one and a red on one, and you cross that on the inside, you will not have communication on the outdoor game. Um, loss of communication usually occurs because of a uh, junction that's been installed or they didn't know was there, uh, or two, uh, these connections are not solid. This kind of shows you the variable, very various connections here. Uh, they do have a model data card to tell the unit exactly what it is. It does have the seven, seven segment fault display. 
I'm going to do what it is. Uh, you got your two test pins here. You got your test one, test two. Uh, with these, you can clear faults, uh, start a test mode, uh, check operation. Uh, do not stick anything into this. Uh, what's our phone jack for here? With the variable speed, Outdoor Control Board manages the functions of the outdoor unit and handles the communication between the outdoor unit and the Ethernet smart thermostat. The board is powered up by 24 volts. That's going to be your RC. The communication wire, the communication takes place at E1 and E2. Uh, there are a couple dip switches here uh, that you can offset with your superheat. Um, so basically, it's going to come out of the box at zero. Your offset, zero offset, you can minus four, minus two, or plus two. So if you have to. Uh, this is the third dip switch. Uh, defrost one, defrost two. Um, out of the box is going to defrost termination temperature at 60 degrees. Uh, you can drop that down to 50, 40, or 70 if you felt like you needed to. The VSO, VSODC. Uh, does not sense high refrigerant pressure, uh, compressor discharge temperature, or inverter drive temperature. Those imports, inputs are connected directly to the inverter, inverter drive board that operates the compressor. Uh, status of these sensors is communicated via the Modbus connection, uh, which would be a gray wire between the drive and the VSODC. Uh, functions of the VSODC, uh, managing cooling operation, uh, managing heat mode operation, uh, controls defrost cycle decisions, uh, outdoor unit EXV control, uh, superheat mode, and reporting. Uh, it also controls your outdoor fan motor speed, uh, reversing valve position control, uh, subcooling measurement, uh, memory card storage of the outdoor unit information, a couple of test mode functions include uh, error codes and status code display, uh, error code history report, uh, compressor RPM status report, uh, compressor and outdoor fan test. Um, it can be a little cumbersome sometimes to you really get it down uh, to be able to flip through there and get the histories. Um, if you have the Econet uh, thermostat control hooked up inside, uh, you can basically view all this from the status mode. It'll tell you everything that's going on. Uh, this is your filter board right here. Uh, not much to it. So you have your 208, 230 going into your L1, L2, and it travels out. You have your 208, 230 here. Uh, the filter. The purpose of the filter board is to, to eliminate any high frequency noise that may be coming from the incoming power line. Uh, this filtering makes it more efficient for the inverter board to convert the incoming single phase into three phase DC. Uh, the use of the filter board also prevents noise distortion from the heat pump transmitting back in, onto the power lines. Uh, these are pretty simple, uh, power in, power out. Uh, if you have 208, 230 in, you don't have it out, you have a bad filter board. It basically connects directly to the incoming voltage. Uh, the filter boards will rarely fail electrically. Uh, if it does, the board will have line voltage in, but nothing out. You also have what they call ferrite rings here. You'll see these iron cores uh, with the black and black and yellow wires uh, wrapped around them. Over here you have black, uh, black, yellow, and reds wrapped around it. Uh, three ferrite rings are applied across the high voltage wires to prevent one wire from inducing voltage into another. Uh, this prevents electromagnetic interference 
and unexpected operation. Uh, one ferrite surrounds the incoming voltage, the second surrounds the wires at the output, and the third is looped around the compressor wires. Now these are, will, they will not fail because they're just ferrite rings, um, unless they were broken in some fashion. Uh, at the bottom here, you have your control board model, model data card. Uh, that contains the outdoor unit that is used by the Econet smart thermostat for system setup. Um, the data cards cannot be swapped between A models and B models. Uh, if the control board is replaced, the data card from the previous board must be used on the replacement board. I know there have been a few revisions, uh, some back in June or July, I think. So if, if they make some revisions and changes on these, uh, they'll actually program that into the model data cards. So if they do, uh, if there's something serious enough, uh, they'll send a service note out uh, with the updated changes, uh, or if you just swap the, swap the card out. Uh, if a card would fail or get broken or damaged, uh, you can order a new card anytime, but it's very specific that uh, you order the exact model, serial number uh, card for this unit. Uh, if not, you can end up with some uh, erratic operation. Uh, here's your Copeland variable speed scroll compressor. Uh, this compressor is a variable speed scroll type that is powered by a three phase DC squared wave variable frequency signal. Uh, the board can drive the compressor at an RPM range of between 900 and 7,000. Uh, the allowable operating RPMs vary from models of the outdoor units. Uh, you can check the RPM table uh, in reference of the manual to see what you ex could be expected to see on a normal operation. Uh, since the compressor is variable speed and system operation is typical at the lower end of the RPM range, uh, the compressor has an oil, oil return mode, which may ramp up uh, the compressor to a pre-programmed oil return speed for a few minutes uh, if the system has been running on low speed for a period of two hours. The compressor is also protected by a refrigerant migration by an off cycle 40 watt stator uh, sump heater cycle regime. Uh, it does have a discharge line temperature sensor attached to uh, the discharge line near the compressor. Um, detect abnormally high line temperature uh, that can damage the compressor oil and is bearing. A uh, high discharge temperature typically occurs when the system is lacking refrigerant uh, or refrigerant flow is restricted. Uh, high discharge temperatures can also occur if the conditions face heat load is too high. If this sensor detects high line temperature, uh, the inverter will initiate what they call a pullback um, of the requested RPM and attempt to lower the compressor speed. Uh, lower the speed in an attempt to lower the temperature. Should the problem continue, uh, it'll keep continuing that to try to get it down below a certain temperature. Uh, if it can't do that, it will lock it out. The units have a built-in high pressure control switch uh, that's connected to the inverter board at the H high pressure switch plug. Uh, the switch opens uh, for excessive pressure. Uh, it's calibrated to open at 600 10 pounds per psi, PSI G, and will reset at 420 psi G. Uh, the switch is an auto reset type. Uh, if the high pressure trips switch opens three times in the same call for operation, uh, the system will lock out the compressor and run only the outdoor fan, reducing condensing pressure. Uh, the EcoNet smart thermostat and the outdoor unit will display a high pressure error code. Uh, most common, common causes of high pressure include overcharging uh, and dirty outdoor coils. Uh, low air volume and heating can also cause high pressure. Uh, where we typically see this is if you put a unit in in the summertime, everything will work fine all summer long. Uh, as soon as they go to turn the heat on, it starts locking out high pressure. Uh, what, that's a, what that's an indication of uh, is that it's overcharged. Uh, 
maybe what was put in. Uh, they didn't dial the charge in. Uh, it is critical uh, to allow these units to run and stabilize, whether it's in heating or cooling, uh, to ensure that your charge uh, is correct. Uh, once again, you have a tr uh, tr suction pressure transducer on the outside here. Uh, that's in, using the inputs used for the EXB superheat calculation. Uh, basically, it's using uh, a five volts DC applied to the uh, transducer. Uh, the return voltage uh, will be between 0.4.5 and 4.5 volts DC on the green wire. Uh, that voltage can be converted uh, to a specific pressure. In this case here, kind of example here, uh, it says 222.8 PSIA, uh, 375 times the volts DC, volts DC in, uh, which gives you a PSIA of 14.7. There's actually a chart, uh, there's a chart in the installation manual, there's also a chart uh, online at my room. Uh, you also have a liquid line pressure transducer. Uh, the liquid line uh, basically is uh, designed to perform the liquid line uh, subcooling calculations. Uh, same, same principle. Uh, the control board will apply 5 volts DC, which can be measured between the red and the black. Uh, the return voltage uh, between 0.5 and 4.5 DC on the purple or violet wire. Uh, and then that you can use that voltage to calculate your pressure. Now, both of these can be read also on your Ethernet control. If you go into the unit, uh, check your ADC heat pump, uh, go to the status menu, and you scroll through, it'll actually give you what your transducers are reading. As well as your semesters. Here's the compressor discharge temperature sensor. Uh, so basically, it's monitoring the discharge temperature. Uh, if that discharge line rises to above 225, uh, the inverter will reduce the compressor RPM incrementally until uh, till the temperature drops to 200 degrees. Uh, after the discharge line reaches 200 degrees, the board will gradually increase the RPM until the compressor returns to normal speed uh, based on the capacity. Uh, should the discharge line rise to 225 degrees again, uh, the, inverter, the inverter will repeat uh, the same cycle, reducing it down uh, to below uh, 200. If the inverter board reduces the speed of the compressor, the yellow diagnostic LED on the inverter board will blink five times to indicate the compressor speed has been reduced. Uh, the sensor protects the compressor from excessively high internal temperatures that can be caused by undercharging, uh, high heat loads, and over refrigerant refrigerant restriction. Right here you have your liquid line sensor, basically a, a, a call a bullet permister. Uh, this sensor is used to uh, perform your subcooling calculations by the VSOD, VSODC. Uh, this con connector uh, connects to the control board via plug OLT. Uh, it's a negative coefficient type permister. It is basically a 10k ohm permister. Uh, so if you know your Temperature of this line, or it's attached to, or you can put it in a glass of ice water. Once you can uh, determine a stable temperature for it, then you can convert that over on a 10 k ohm chart to see if your resistance lines up correctly. Uh, you also have one on the suction line, uh, suction line temperature permit sensor uh, that's used to calculate your operating superheat level to control your EXP. Same principle. Uh, it's a negative coefficient for Mr. 10K on the uh, You also have your outdoor air temperature sensor. 
the sensor is used by the VSODC for low ambient cooling and key mode operations. Uh, the sensor can also be used to perform in conjunction with the defrost cycle calculations. Uh, the sensor connects to the control board uh, via the plug OAT. Uh, that is a 10K ohm resistor as well. So if you know what your outdoor ambient temperature is, or you can put it in a glass of ice water to, to get a stable temperature, uh, you can put that on a 10K ohm chart to cross-reference. You also have an outdoor coil temperature sensor. Uh, this sensor input is used by the VSODC to perform defrost cycle calculations. You have the variable speed outdoor fan motor. The picture kind of shows you the uh, on the bat wing blades. Uh, this motor is a completely variable speed ECM motor. Uh, the motor is powered by a direct connection uh, to the incoming T30 volt line. Uh, the motor speed is controlled by a pulse width modulation uh, from the control board. The control board will determine the outdoor fan motor speed requirement and will output the proper voltage to the drive motor at the correct speed. Uh, during off operation, the outdoor fan motor will be matched to the compressor speed. Uh, the required fan, fan motor speed can change based upon the operating conditions. Uh, the motor is a one-piece design. Uh, if the motor fails, the complete assembly is replaced. Uh, so you can't replace the modules on these. Uh, you have your standard reversing valve, 24 volt reversing valve. Uh, the reversing valve directs the hot gas discharge to the outdoor coil during cooling and defrost and shifts the hot gas to inside during heating. We also have the EXV on here on the outside unit, uh, electrically driven refrigerant metering device. Uh, a little black rubber, rubber piece here. Uh, that's your magnetic stepper motor. Uh, that's looking uh, controlled by a 12 volt DC pulse uh, to open and close that. It's a 500 step motor. Uh, so it's very audible. Uh, you put your hand on it and you can feel it. Uh, you also want to make sure that you can kind of push down on it and make sure that it's uh, flush. If it's loose or popping up a little bit, uh, you'll end up with some theoretic operation. But the valve adjusts refrigerant flow to the evaporator coil based upon the suction pressure and the suction line temperature. They do have some dip switches related to the EXVs, um, as with the indoor board and the outdoor board or the uh, coil board. Um, the step switch one is for your steps. Uh, it comes in the off position, which is a 500 step motor. Um, all current EXVs with green are 500 steps. Uh, if you turn that on, uh, it thinks it's a 1600 step motor. Uh, so it will, I've seen one guy do that, um, and it, it's some serious erratic operation. Uh, so that's really crazy. Uh, we had to kind of walk through and actually catch that one of these guys turn that switch on. Uh, second, two dip switches that you can make minor uh, superheat adjustments if needed. Now on initial power up, the EXV, the valve will be fully closed. Uh, the valve will then fully open. Uh, during that time, if you listen or put your hand on it, you'll, you'll hear it and feel it. Um, so that's telling you when you're hearing that, it's either opening or closing. Uh, once it starts, um, once the valve's in a fully open or driven open position, once the call for heat or cool, Initiates uh, after a few seconds, the valve will move to a mid position. Uh, at that point, it begins to monitor the EXV, uh, your pressure transducer, and your thermistor. Uh, then the heating 
before cooling cycle ends, the valve closes for five minutes. Uh, this allows the refrigerant and the evaporator to absorb additional heat during the blow off cycle. After five minutes, the valve is fully open and ready for another cooling or heating cycle. Uh, during the off cycle, if the system is powered up, uh, after the completion, uh, both the indoor EXV and the outdoor EXV will fully open. Kind of goes over the dip switches uh, you need to offset. I've not known anybody yet to have actually offset, uh, but factory offset is zero. Uh, if you want to go minus four for the offset, uh, on and off, minus two. Okay, inside you will have a uh, a filter dryer that is shipped uh, by flow for heat pumps, uh, regular single one way for ACs. The dryer should be installed in the liquid line between the indoor and outdoor units. Uh, the best location for the dryer is in a cool area along with the line set if possible. Ideally out of the sunlight uh, near the foil. Uh, when placed in a cool area, the dryer is capable of holding more moisture. Uh, they also, these units have accumulators. Uh, the outdoor unit features a suction line accumulator. Uh, the accumulator is designed to prevent liquid flood back the compressor in both the heating and cooling mode. Uh, these units will also contain a charge compensator. Uh, it will look just like a filter dryer. Uh, you can see here it's got three lines to it. So the black filter dryer and the filter dryer over here. Uh, the charge compensator tank is installed in the outdoor coil vapor line that connects to the outdoor coil to the reversing valve. Uh, the tank removes refrigerant in the heat mode and returns it to the system in the cooling mode. In the cooling mode, this line is a hot gas uh, line. Uh, in the heating mode, this is the suction line. A second line attaches to the compressor tank, compensator tank, and is connected to the liquid line. Uh, this tank, tank surrounds the line, so the refrigerant in the tank is not exposed to the vapor traveling inside the line. Uh, when the unit is in cooling mode, the tank is hot. When the unit is in heating mode, the tank is cool. Uh, hot migrates to cold, so when the tank is in heat mode, if the refrigerant will migrate into the tank and leave the operating system. When the system is in cooling, with defrost, the tank gets hot and the liquid migrates back into the system. Some basic board functions. Uh, the DSODC, DSODC uh, heat mode, superheat calculations, uh, the outdoor unit pressure can reducer input, and the suction line temperature sensor input are used to calculate the operating suction for superheat and the heat element. And that value will be displayed on the ECF thermostat. Uh, we'll also do a liquid subcooling calculation. Uh, the outdoor unit, uh, liquid pressure transducer input, and the liquid line temperature are used to calculate the operating liquid subcooling. Uh, the subcooling value is displayed on the ECF thermostat as well. Uh, also, defrost mode calculations. Defrosting the outdoor unit uh, is controlled by the DSODC. Uh, RP20 heat pumps utilize the default of the defrost, uh, which, in, which initiates a defrost cycle only when defrosting is detected on the outdoor floor during the heating operation. Uh, the DSODC continues, continuously monitors the outdoor ambient temperature, the OAT and the outdoor cool temperature to that end to determine when a cycle is required. Uh, defrost initiation is initiated when the following, mission, met, following conditions are met. Uh, the outdoor coil temperature is below 35 degrees. Uh, the compressor has operated for at least 34 minutes with the indoor coil temperature. Below 35 degrees, 
and the BSODC determine the deep cost cycle is required based upon the OAP and the adapted instruments. It's got a number of things that it has to meet first uh, before we'll actually initiate. Uh, I've seen some where they get pretty frosty um, and you think, wow, it should be defrosted. Um, but when it's required to, based upon this algorithm, uh, time, temperatures of the algorithm, uh, once it meets defrost, it will be frosted pretty much. They do have some protection features on, features on there as well. Uh, minimum runtime, a uh, minimum runtime of 30 seconds is maintained by the VSODC to minimize short cycle, which can be harmful to this compressor. Uh, when the system has been operating at significantly reduced capacity for an extended period of time, the VSODC will signal the inverter to speed up the compressor to 100% capacity to help bring the oil back into the Compressor some. Uh, you also have an off cycle refrigerant migration protection. Uh, refrigerant can migrate to a cold compressor during off cycle, which can dilute the oil or result in oil being pumped out in the compressor starters. Uh, when, when needed, the VSODC will signal, signal the inverter to energize one of the compressor's further windings uh, to generate enough heat to warm the compressor to prevent migration. Uh, if you have the ETO net hooked up, um, it will show what your crankcase temperature is from the ETO net. Um, if, you start, if you start this up on a cool day and the, the crankcase heater is below, I believe it's 50 degrees, um, it will not start. So if you're out, out putting one in on a very, very cold day, uh, as soon as you get it in there, Get it wired up. Uh, wired up, let that crankcase start heat pad. Um, depending on the temperature, sometimes it happens pretty quickly, uh, sometimes it happens pretty slowly. Uh, but you know, let that uh, crankcase start heat pad. And it does monitor the high discharge temperature that we discussed. Uh, if, we, if it achieves 225 degrees, it's going to start reducing the RPMs until it temperature drops below 200. Uh, high discharge pressure, uh, as we discussed earlier, uh, the high the high pressure contact will open up a 610 psi that will close back at 420. Uh, if you have a compressor shutdown sequence for high or low pressure. Uh, the compressor is commanded to operate at zero RPMs for a minimum of five minutes. Uh, the outdoor EXV will be directed to completely close for a period of five minutes and then open up completely. Uh, the outdoor fan motor will continue to operate during the five minute compressor off load. Uh, the VSODC and the Econet Smart Thermostat will display uh, the act applicable fault. Uh, after five minutes, of Heating or cooling demand, if it's still present, uh, the pressure has reached the reset conditions. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, normal operation will reset. We also have low pressure or loss of charge. Uh, the control board continuously monitors the suction pressure transducer and will protect the compressor from damage by shutting it down when the suction pressure drops below 50 PSIG in the cooling mode and below 50 PSIG in the heating mode. Uh, low pressure can result from inadequate airflow, uh, no refrigerant charge, no fail PXV, or if you have a restriction in the refrigerant circuit. Uh, the VSODC will allow the compressor to restart if the suction pressure rises to 95 PFO, PSIG uh, in the cooling mode and 40 PSIG in the heating mode. If there are three low pressure faults in the same call for cooling uh, during the 120 minutes of, or 120 minutes of continuous heating, uh, it will lock it out at a L21.
Uh, active system protection features. If the system experiences low pressure lockout, uh, the system should be evaluated to determine the cause for the low pressure condition uh, and correction action taken for the cause. Uh, possible, inclusions, possible causes include low refrigerant, uh, fell indoor blower motor, dirty air filter, uh, or dirty indoor foil, and cooling mode, or low refrigerant charge for a failed outdoor motor or dirty outdoor foil. Um, it is important. Um, we'll get to the charging here shortly, but it is important that you're in test mode. Uh, the older eco nets say uh, high cool or high heat. Um, the newer ones say charge cool or charge heat. Um, but you're actually operating in the uh, charge test mode. Uh, you just turn it on. You could be in a very low RPM. Uh, which will give you some idea of what the refrigerant is, but it's not giving you a true uh, shot of what the refrigerant is truly in part of that. Uh, if you have overcurrent and current imbalances, if the current compressor current exceeds an acceptable level for the compressor or inverter, the inverter will reduce the compressor speed to allow the current to return to an acceptable level. Uh, if there's a current imbalance between the compressor Three phase windings, the inverter will shut the compressor down for three to five minutes, uh, lock the compressor out if there's three faults and keep the faults in operation. Uh, you will see that fault, which we'll get into that. It's a T901 fault for the uh, 15 uh, generic code. Uh, your overcurrent or current imbalance, um, one that can be electric, uh, high incoming voltage, or two. Uh, if you have some excessive uh, static pressure, if you have 1.25 or what they call uh, out, you know, out of balance or uh, unavailable uh, static pressure on the Ethernet, um, if your static pressure is so high, it inadvertently affects your charge. Uh, as a byproduct of that, you're going to get overcurrent faults with the P901, and you'll get them very quite continually actually. Uh, it'll also get you're, you're getting current balance. Um, the next fault uh, protection is the compressor compressor operation outside the envelope. Uh, the compressor converter detects the compressor motor torque exceeds an acceptable level for the compressor. The rever the inverter will reduce the compressor speed to keep the torque at acceptable level. Uh, it's trying to protect the compressor. Uh, a lot of these faults, uh, if the generic codes 15 or 16 uh, is charge. Uh, it'll fall into charge and uh, static pressure. So if you do the whole checklist, uh, it kind of goes through there, but it's important, number one, to make sure that your static pressure is acceptable. Uh, number two, that your charge is correct. Uh, and you do that by going into for the test mode, uh, in the, in the check mode for cooling, or check mode, charge mode for heat, or charge mode for cooling. Uh, this is a big one. If the supply voltage for internal DC is not within a typical range, it will also shut down the compressor so the voltage returns to a typical level. Uh, inverter over temperature, if you're very getting too hot. Uh, it will shut that down to try to protect the inverter drive. Uh, controls and communication malfunction. If the control senses a malfunction within the control system or communication or model data is not available, the controls will act to shut down the system, prevent the system from operating at a condition that may cause harm to their components. Uh, we had a dealer that. Um, they put the wrong drive board on. They put a four-ton uh, drive board on a two-ton unit. Um, it will actually fit and it'll wire up. Uh, the problem is it looks totally different. And as soon as you hook that up, it recognized that immediately. It would not function. So it's very quick to catch problems uh, and it'll shut everything down to prevent any kind of damage. Uh, 
uh, exiting active protection lockout mode uh, can be accomplished by either one disconnecting electrical power to both the indoor and outdoor units for one minute, uh, then restoring power. Uh, keep in mind there is a reason for the lockout, so the fault code on the variable speed outdoor control or the internet thermostat should be read to assist with diagnosing the root cause of the lockout. Um, and corrective action should be taken to protect the system. And if you're reading the generic code on the VSODC, uh, it can have you kind of going down rabbit holes. Uh, it's a very wide net fault code. Uh, if you're checking the specific fault codes on the internet, uh, it will give you like a T901A, uh, something like that. Um, different combinations, but it'll give you a very specific fault code. So you know exactly what you're looking for. Uh, if you have a discharge, you know, it's 16 volts out of code. Uh, there's one, uh, it's a generic code and it covers everything. Um, it's the same active fault code specifically, uh, which would have, would have told you that you had a uh, discharge temperature in place. But the generic fault code wouldn't tell you that. So that's why it's super important to uh, have the Ethernet hooked up to it. Well, I'll tell you what, let's take a small uh, 10 minute break here. Uh, and then we'll pick back up here uh, about 110. Take a little break. Thanks. Okay, we're back here. We'll get started with some diagnostic uh, and charts and also charging here. So we're going to jump right into the different diagnostics here. Uh, from the outdoor control board, you will see here, if you see a lowercase c, it's in first stage cooling, or uh, if it's a flashing c, lowercase, it's in delay. If you see a uppercase c, it's in second stage or high stage cooling. Uh, if it's a second stage c flashing, uh, it's in delay as well. Uh, if you see a D on the board, it's indicating defrost. Uh, if it's, you see an, a small H, that's first stage heat pump. Uh, small H flashing is a delay. Uh, uppercase H is high stage heat, heat pump. Uh, uppercase H is uh, delay. Uh, when you first turn the unit on, there's no call for either heat uh, or cool. Uh, you will see a zero at the standby. We won't go through all the codes today, but we'll go through some of them so you kind of get an idea. Uh, like this first one here, you'll see uh, T901 uh, inverter fault compressor odor current. Um, you'll see that as a 15 on the outdoor unit uh, code. Now, on the Econet thermostat, it's going to say T901 zero. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that's the description of the compressor is pulling more current than allowed to start. Uh, possible solutions, uh, system grossly overcharged, uh, compressor full of oil liquid, compressor shorted to ground, uh, check resistance of the wire windings back to ground, or tight compressor. Um, some of those are kind of obvious. Uh, if it's grossly overcharged, um, you can tell that uh, once you're in test mode pretty quickly. Uh, a tight compressor is a little hard to diagnose. It's short of the ground, uh, the compressor will never start. Um, and the original uh, installation manuals will give you a whole check to go through. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but what I've just learned and experienced with different ones in the field, um, your charge can be perfect. Um, but if your static pressure is excessive, um, that will your charge may still look good, uh, but it's not. Um, so your static pressure is affecting the, the operation. Uh, if you have excessive static pressure, you will get this code T901 guaranteed. So you kind of got to watch that. Um, next one's the envelope protection. 
uh, it'll give you error code 31 on the front of the code net, it'll give you E902 uh, in the local section. Uh, over here, you kind of go through. This is a big one, verify refrigerant charge, often related to overcharging for uh, high convincing pressures. Uh, you start one up in the winter time. Uh, you just think, okay, I've got 30 feet of line set. I'm good to go, let it flow. Uh, chances are, and I've seen this with a couple of them, um, you'll, you'll come out of the gate with T901s, T902s, um, and it's, it's charge issues and or static pressure. Uh, but if you come over here, you'll start to see, okay, the generic codes, uh, 15, 15. Uh, right here it says T903, tells you that's an inverter fault, PSC overcurrent. Uh, check your choke, choke connections, replace choke if it is burnt. If choke doesn't work, check the drive. Uh, with your choke, you're basically looking to see if it's open or it's closed with resistance. Uh, come down here, once again, 15, this is a, this is a T905, uh, DC bus under voltage. This tells you that the DC bus voltage is dropped below 175 volts DC. Now, as you can see, these are the 15 is just a generic code. Uh, if you show up and see a 15, if you don't have the Ethernet, you probably won't understand or be able to capture the fact that your voltage is dropped at some point. So this could happen with a, um, a storm or anything like that. Uh, it will reset, uh, but it will still show the, the fault. So as you kind of go down a little further, um, gives you different various, various codes, but once again, we're back into a 15. Uh, 15 uh, CFC over temp, CIM over temp. Uh, unless you know what the true fault is with the Ethernet, T908, um, T909, you're just in a generic code. Uh, this one here indicates you that the, the module, uh, the drive module is overheated, so the compressor may stop or pull back. Uh, without having the Ethernet hooked up, you would not know that. We're going to start just checking a bunch of various things that are related to the very, to the generic code of 15. Uh, so the 15 and the 16 are kind of generic. Um, a lot of things fall into those. So we're 16 uh, inverter over discharge temp. Uh, you also get a uh, a com a communications fault. That also falls into 16. So you can, you can kind of chase yourself down some rabbit holes with these generic codes. So that's a, the biggest reason to have a uh, Ethernet hooked up to these systems. You kind of go a little further. Same faults again and again and again. <clears throat> so it is very uh, important that. Uh, you're able to hone in exactly what you're looking for. So we'll talk about charging. Uh, system startup and refrigeration charging. Um, once the system is hardwired and, and the wiring has probably properly been installed, the next step is to start the system, uh, verify the airflow, uh, adjust the refrigerant charge uh, to ensure optimum comfort, efficiency, reliability. Uh, it's important to follow these procedures <clears throat> to ensure indoor comfort and refrigerant charging at rest. Uh, you, you wire everything up um, and you get communication errors. Uh, like if you get a communication on the outdoor unit, uh, you may have a loose wire uh, at the E1, E2, somewhere between the outdoor and the indoor. You have those wires crossed, so it's easy to kind of start with the wiring first. Um, so once once it's plugged in, your Econet will uh, lock in what it is. Um, so there's no real adjustments required from there. <coughs> you can fine tune your airflow slightly. 
uh, with that. Um, so a couple ways you can do this. Uh, the easiest way to do it is from the eco map uh, You go into the service menu. Uh, you see uh, what we say ODU checkout. Uh, using the eco uh, The older version will show you ODU test or the ODU checkout. Uh, you'll engage either the high tool or the high heat. So that's going to lock it into uh, high heat. By tool. Uh, the newest version, the most up to date versions, it will say charge heat or charge cool. So, what that's going to do is once you lock those in and you put it into the uh, high heat or high cool, it's going to force it to operate at 100% capacity, uh, both the outdoor unit and the indoor unit, uh, which is necessary to accurately uh, check the airflow and refer to the charge. Uh, so once you start that test, uh, you don't want to start looking at it real quickly because um, it takes a, a few minutes to get up to 100%. Uh, once it gets to 100%, you really want to let it run for at least 35 minutes, 35 to 45 minutes before you mess with the charge. So while that's going, you'll hear your indoor fan start to ramp up. You see the outdoor unit start to ramp up. Uh, you can actually go into the status section, uh, basically go back one screen and you'll see status. Uh, from there, you can check uh, one of the status for your furnace or air handler. Uh, it will tell you what your static pressure is. Uh, so if it tells you you're at 0.79, you're good. Uh, you're well below the one inch uh, static pressure. Uh, if, if it tells you you're over one, 10.2, 1.3, if it says unknown, uh, that means your static pressure is excessive. Uh, it's important at that point to figure out, okay, what's going on? Do they have a bunch of vents shut off? <coughs> a bunch of vents shut off. Um, do I have a restricted air filter? Whatever. Then you figure out, okay, it's a problem on the supply side or it's on the return side. A return undersized causing the, the excessive static pressure. So at that point, you have to do some. Uh, manual static pressure test. Um, that's why it's important uh, if you're selling these to do a static pressure test before you sell the job. You know, uh, before you sell the job, put the, put the pain in high uh, high speed and put it in cooling and then do a simple static pressure test uh, on the return side uh, and the supply side. So if you detect then at that point that you're on the return to say on the side and sell them to the public. So at this point you've already sold the job, you put it on now you're selling the uh on the charge. So on the other side on the return. Uh, it's the hard sell after the fact to try to sell more duck work. So at that point you're giving you're giving duck work away for free and it's not a good feeling. So once you get that and your uh, charge cool uh, or charge heat, or high heat, or high cool. Uh, so let that run for at least 35 minutes, 45 minutes. Uh, you should have plenty of stuff to do when you clean it up. Um, on the door panel, it will tell you, um, I'm going to actually pull up a manual here. It will show you. The uh, charging chart for that unit. Uh, so there's an upflow, downflow, horizontal left, horizontal right. It is important uh, that you understand what it is that you're dealing with. Because uh, if you don't, uh, it'll actually end up coming back with a bite check. Back to bike here. So we go to the charging chart right here. In this case here, it's a upflow. So if we have an upflow, for instance, uh, it tells us we have an RP 2060B. And we should have either a, a coil or a RCF 6021. 
upflow or left horizontal. So if you're doing an upflow and a left horizontal, the air flows through the pool the same way. <coughs> if you're doing an air, if you're doing a downflow and a right horizontal, uh, the air actually goes through the pool a different direction. Uh, still flows through there, but there's a little different restriction there. So for instance, if we're in heating, and let's just say we're at 35 degrees and we're in an upflow, our pressures are saying 300, uh, gross pressure is 300 on the high, 82 on the low, sub 40 at 13. And we'll come right over here. So uh, to the downflow heating right here, now we're saying our head pressure gross pressures are 337 and 82 with the subcord of 26. So you can see if you were to cross those up and you should be charging specifically by subcooling, not gross. These pressures here just give you a gross idea, an idea of the ballpark where you're going to be at. What you want to dial it in, into is the subcooling. So if you cross up upflow, downflow, you can be wildly different. So you got to watch that. Now it's important, uh, more so on downflows, um, but upflows as well. So if it calls for a 13 here, um, undershoot that a little bit. In this case here, undershoot that by about three. So you can dial that in, preferably right at a 10. Um, you don't, if, if you get to the 13, 10 to 13, you're okay. Uh, but if you see 13, you probably don't have problems. Now it's going to become even more mon monumental on the on the heating side for a downflow. Um, if it says 26 right here, I would probably dial that in. You'd want to go down. You would want to drop that between three and five degrees under subcooling. So you, you'd want to shoot that at anywhere from uh, 21, 23, 23 being the maximum, 21 would be probably the sweet spot. Because um, if you, in the downflow position, uh, max that out, you will come back with uh, various faults. In the one, in the two, uh, you'll, you'll have various faults that come with the charge. So it's important that number one, <coughs> determine what your orientation is, a flow, downflow, left, right, uh, and then charge it accordingly here, um, but also make sure that you undershoot it slightly. Whatever the required is, undershoot that uh, anywhere from uh, three to five degrees. Um, but also make sure that your static pressure is correct. Uh, if your static pressure is correctly, uh, even though you dial the charge in correctly, you'll still end up with faults. Just just guaranteed. Um, and the bigger the units, you won't notice it in the lower RPMs, but on the hot days and cold days when the units ramp up uh, into the higher RPMs, uh, 3,500 and up, uh, that's where you're going to pick up these faults. So always, whatever the required subcooling is, undershoot that uh, three to five. save you a lot of trouble uh, in the future. So fortunately, when the RP20 heat pumps are matched to the correct indoor air handler or furnace oil combination, and are controlled by the ethernet thermostat, the airflow is automatically controlled to the proper level based upon the body that is stored in the uh, it's actually based on the outdoor unit from the USOB steering center card. That's what's going to lock in the max air flow. So when the indoor blower is operating, the Ethernet thermostat will display the indoor CFM and the service menu of the control. <coughs> Excuse me, the approximate CFM is also displayed in 100 CFM. Now, in the past, everybody would say, oh, I got, you know, my line set's good for 15 feet, 20 feet, whatever it is. 
Um, if these units here don't check into the room, you're selling these as, as, a, as a premium price. Uh, the customers are expecting a premium price. So don't, if you shortchange it, and they're just you know, throwing blue and see what happens, uh, you will be back up here many, many times. Guaranteed. Uh, once you just start replacing parts that don't need to be fixed, uh, you'll be out there multiple times. So, uh, the amount of money you make on the job, you're going to be losing uh, on the, on the callbacks, uh, as well as having some very upset customers. So, uh, whoever's, if your installers are doing this startup, uh, you know, need to set aside at least 35, 45 minutes minimum once it reaches high speed and then dial it in. Uh, three to five under what the data play calls for in sub three. If they do that uh, and your static pressure is correct, you will have no issues. To get into the charge mode, um, basically you set the mode to the off position, uh, tap service, <coughs> uh, then uh, it'll, on the bottom it'll jump up as 3D checkout. Uh, the next screen, if it does display a lockout message, uh, you have up to a five minute delay before you can turn that off. Uh, once the flashing lockout disappears, uh, you'll see where it says, uh, Variable speed ODU test. Uh, go up or down until you find heat charge or cool charge. Uh, for the older version, uh, it'll say high heat or cool, or high cool, and then tap the test. Now, once you start the test, it will stay there until you turn it off. So once you're done with whatever you got to do, make sure you go back and turn it off. Oh, yeah, here. I can find it. Um, if you have access to my ring, if you go into the product section and you come over here, so it's EcoNet product help pages, click on here. This is kind of handy. So if you don't, if you're out on a field and you don't have access to the manual, uh, obviously feel free to call me. We can walk through it together. Um, or if you have access to my ring, uh, you can go in here and say you're working with an RP28. I'll click here. So from here, I can go in here, I can find out transducer. It will actually give me uh, the online calculator is not working, but it will tell me the math to work through the transducer. I'll tell you how to work, how to test bad reversing valves. If that's the case for you, you got to troubleshoot one. And where it gets really good, uh, charging, inspector charging. It'll also give you, if you're questioning what your compressor speeds are. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you have a RP20, 36B uh, in low heat, the expected RPMs would be 1800 RPMs uh, intermittent. Uh, mid speed would be 2133. Uh, charge heat would uh, give you 2800 RPMs. Uh, if you're in heat max, which is considered overdrive, you can actually go up as high as 5700 RPMs. And you can see they change from unit to unit. Like a 60B has the option to go up to 6,500 RPMs. If you look in the charge heat, the RPMs are at 4,100. So big jump from three times to two times, so as well as a below coring speed. They vary as well. Now, the great feature about this, if you have the EcoNet hooked up, you can go in here. Hit the alarms button. Hit EcoNet thermostat because you're checking your thermostat codes. Now you can simply come down through here. Now, say if you have a TN01 overcurrent fault, we'll click that. 
and it will tell you right here your VSODC will give you a 15, uh, Equinox Scanner 1, and these are your LEDs as well. It will actually give you an exact uh, symptom of the fault code. Uh, it will also tell you various ways to check uh, the particular fault zone. Got every position, every fault in here, like this is a good one here, the last rate of position. I'll tell you. Now, if you ever come across the lost rotor position fault, chances are it's this massive the overcharge. Now, overcharging comes from a couple of different things. Charging in the wrong uh, speed. Uh, charging too quickly. That's why it's important to wait 35 to 45 minutes uh, in between. Uh, when you start it in high in test, uh, to charge cooler heat is important to wait minimum 35 minutes. Uh, you, if you start charging way ahead of time, by the time it's truly stabilized, you could be way over. To give you exact conditions there. <coughs> Go back one more here for those of you who may not be familiar with the Econet interface. And all this is on my room, so we can come down here. Um, here. Got a list of all arms. If you have zoning hooked up or zoning. Uh, thermostats, give you your thermostats. In this case, the 700 series. Uh, if you're working on an air handler, uh, RHCP, which is the previous, that early version, uh, two stage that went to the internet, uh, RHMB, you click on that, it will give you all the faults associated with that particular air handler. And it's a thermos. You have an AOTV, 96V, 97, 98. Uh, you just click your thermos. Uh, find the code, it will give you uh, exact uh, fault code, exact ways to diagnose the fault. If you go into thermostats here, it's always nice if you can actually play with one in the field. Um, it gives you everything your communication, CMS alarm, uh, wiring, gives you compatible equipment, uh, Wi Fi provisioning, setup. Dual fuel setup, humidity. So here is kind of a cool one. You hit the green stimulator, and you end up with this thermostat. And you can't play with everything because you only have to go so far. Uh, so if you click on the ring uh, and a real thermostat, you'd enter your service phone number, uh, your company's name, or your contractor's name, uh, company name, contractor email. Uh, this Wi-Fi and app support phone number. Uh, this is for if you're on the job site because the customer is supposed to walk through using their phone or their iPad to walk through the app setup. So if they're having trouble setting it up, it may be something on the router's end or something that they're not doing exactly right. Uh, and sometimes they have uh, Green has to go in there do a little tweaking. Um, but this they have an app support thing specifically for that. A customer calls you and says, hey, my app's not working. Uh, the weather's not working on my app now. I'm not an IT guy, and I'm sure you're not either. Um, but Green is nice enough to have an app support team. Uh, all they have to do is call into this number, and they will walk through it with the customer and resolve the issue. So as you walk up here, uh, this is saying we have an error code. We got this hooked up to us. This is our Wi Fi. Uh, this is our humidification or dehumidification study. Click on that. Uh, we can, well, normally we could click, shift this over, and that would enable dehumidification. Uh, we can set our dehumidification set point, uh, over cooling temperature amount, and then also the dehumidifier drain type. <clears throat> now that's going to come factory on. For five minutes. 
that injectors, after a call for cooling, uh, in that's going to shut down the five minutes to allow that coil to try to release all the moisture it can from that coil. Because the new coils are they're bigger, they're denser, and they hold more water. So that's going to shut that off for five minutes. Uh, you can actually modify that up if you need to. You want to stay off 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or you can actually take it down to zero, and at that point, the panel will be cut off. If you flip over to humidification, uh, you can enable humidification. Uh, you can set your set point. Uh, then you can set, do I want to humidify during heat only, uh, heat and fan, or it even gives you an option for heat and the cooler. Uh, smart control will utilize the uh, uh, internet temperature to prevent uh, over humidification. And then humidifying with fan, uh, say yes. Uh, then you can fix your fan. Low, medium, high, for humidification on. Once you're in here, you've got your home and away settings. Uh, for here, you have select your mode, auto, heat, cool, emergency heat if you have a heat pump, fan, and on. So if you want just the fan to run period by itself, fan, hit that. But right. turn it off. Now we can set it cool. Now we can go into the basic settings over here. Do our settings. Over here we can say uh, we want our constant fan to be a medium low, medium low, medium high, medium high. So we can set our constant fan speed over here. So you're not running a full bore. You have your basic settings, follow schedule. You don't want it to be programmable. Click that off and we'll schedule. Um, I would recommend turning off this alarm and it be enabled. Uh, if you don't, as soon as you get an alarm, it's going to start going beep, beep, and the customer will be calling you soon enough. So turn that off. Uh, temperature display in Fahrenheit. You can have your Celsius if you need to. Over here, you have your dead band, two degrees. You have a temperature offset. If you need to offset that for somebody, um, I've had to do that with people at home where somebody's one person's really cold, one person's really hot. Yeah, so you can kind of trick, trick the person that's giving the most trouble and make it uh, suitable for the whole family. Uh, you have your relative humidity offset. If you can verify that your humidity, for instance, is whatever percentage. You can offset that a little bit to give a more true, truer reading. You can. Uh, you have a sensor option for a room sensor uh, if you want to, or use the internal uh, proximity sensing and skew enable. And you get over here, you can go to the installer menu. And here's where you kind of get into fine tuning. So if you've got an EcoNet set up, for instance, it's going to say, normally it would say EcoNet uh, outside selection, it will say EcoNet, and it will say lock. Uh, your variable speed clamp means it's locked at 7,000 RPM. Uh, if your cool airflow is just, you can say, uh, it needs a little more airflow. So you can increase that 10%, or you can drop it back 10% if you want to uh, dehumidify with that. Air handler, you can go in here. Uh, if you have a auxiliary heat, you want to make sure you put that in there. Uh, if you want to adjust your EXP super heat, you can do that from here. If you have a gas furnace, uh, it gives you the option to change your orientation, upflow, downflow. Run soft delay, you can adjust your high heat airflow. Uh, you can actually go none. More, or, uh, basically ten percent more, or, or the max, or you can actually drop that by low or low. So you've got to adjust your high heat, high heat airflow and your low heat airflow to accommodate your temperature. Here it tells you what kind of filter you have, what type of fuel you have. Okay. 
we would happen to have a water heater hooked up. We've got that right here too. We can change that accordingly. So pretty cool. Now here's where it gets cool. So if you're, if you're in a um, first start of the system, you put it in check mode, test mode, charge mode, you go here to your furnace. Right here. Pull one down, it gives you static pressure. Key to have this part below one. So if you're at 0.99 and below, 0.99 you push it. Uh, but you want to watch that when it's at 100%. That's the key. Uh, check your static pressure. If it's excessive, over one or unknown, just get over one, resolve that first. And if you don't resolve that, your charge will never be right. Uh, and you will get nuisance faults. Uh, eventually, you'll get damage at the compressor. Uh, they call it the 901 fault. It gets a death if you get it enough times. Uh, you can replace them in the pressure. This will give you your static pressure for the outside temperature. Okay, now if we go into the AC heat pump here, and tell us. Be able to track our high cool, low cool. And here is where it gets kind of cool. So from inside the thermostat here, uh, you can verify what exactly the inverter speed the compressor is running at. Uh, you can match that to the uh, expected RPM speed. So here it tells you what your crankcase heater temp is. If it's down below 50, uh, the unit won't run. So we know. Right now, that case heater is 53.7, so it would get shaped. It'll actually tell us what our secret heater is. So, it's great. Uh, suction line temperature, 9.1. Suction line pressure, 4.2 psi C. There's a lot of things that you can find from that. Same thing with your uh, air handler status. You can go in here and find an electric heat on. It'll give me a CFM, an RPM, and a little bit. So here we'll tell you what your EXV condition is. So it's here, it's 58%, 52.2%. Uh, it's what our current superheat is, 1.1, uh, 1.1, <coughs> saturation temp, and saturation pressure. Now, what this won't tell you is what your subscript is. It'll tell you what your pressures are, but it won't tell you what your suction is. So you can't necessarily charge from the inside. Uh, once it's charged appropriately, then you could through come in here uh, and check the pressures and everything from the thermostat. Um, but as far as actual charging, uh, you know, making a big repair or startup, you have to make sure that you walk it all the way through. Uh, Start it up, check your static, make sure it's acceptable. At that point, put it in the charge or test uh, for cool, charge or test for heat, and then allow it to run for at least 35 to 45 minutes. Uh, if you have a, for instance, if you have a downflow situation and you're uh, 10 feet from the uh, hot oil unit to the air handler, Chances are you are you're overcharged out of the gate. So in a case like that, if you say, okay, it's really close, even an upflow, it'll be more dramatic than the downflow. Uh, to see that, you have, you have to be ready to start uh, removing some of the uh, So once you get that to an appropriate, uh, safe amount, I'll take a whole bunch out because you need to put some back in. So adjust as you need to to a safe amount, and then you want to get that. Uh, minimum 35 minutes, 35 to 45 minutes one time. At that point, it's, it's stable. You know exactly what the charge is, and then you can make, make your adjustments accordingly. So it is very, uh, they're super great units. Uh, if they're put in correctly, the bulk of the problems are not there. Uh, if you put them in kind of haphazardly, uh, don't take certain things such as static pressure. 
uh, into a into a flag. Uh, you don't charge them properly. Uh, guarantee that you will have problems. That's it. Well, I'm going to stop this here. Um, that's our two part series on the Ream Inverter products. Um, it's a lot of it, a lot of information to go through uh, in a short amount of time. Uh, if you haven't, you know, had the uh, pleasure to work on one yet or sell one yet, uh, by all means, uh, don't be afraid. Uh, they're super easy units. To work on just make sure that you kind of you're aware that the where you're selling it or where it's installed that it is appropriate uh, for that application and it'll work uh, properly. So um, I do appreciate you attending the uh, webinars. If you do have any problems, I left my uh, name and number and email in the chat feature here. Um, so if you have any problems or any questions anytime, please feel free to call me. Um, I do appreciate your attending. Thank you very much.